Well, my impression of Constantine is a fascinating character in history and one who is not really very well understood. A general student of the last 2,000 years of history, if you've taken a world history class, one has the impression that Constantine is this great guy who uh, converts to Christianity, who discovers the importance of Christianity, and brings Christianity to the Roman Empire. It's unclear that Constantine ever converted to Christianity, and if he did so, probably it was on his deathbed. His greatest interest in Christianity apparently was aroused when he, as a very superstitious pagan, found that some of his soldiers who were Christians, who were carrying a cross on their shield, didn't die in battle and, and weren't wounded, and he became interested in whether this cross had actually protected them or not. Um, he set about expanding Roman power in that time period, and I believe he and his advisors saw in Christianity and monotheism, really, uh, a very powerful set of political ideas with which to unite the disparate uh, empire. And he saw great potential in bringing together emperor and pope and being able to control a world stretching from Ireland to Turkey and beyond um, with a single belief system that found resonance with the populace. And so finally Constantine wised up. Um, he had an army, the majority of who, who, whose foot soldiers were Christians. And they didn't want to fight a pagan emperor's wars. They didn't want to fight to start with. They were pacifists. And so he had this convenient vision of a cross in the sky saying, this is the sign in which you will conquer. And he announced that good news to his soldiers, most of whom were Christians. And so they decided to fight. And so Constantine had a fighting army and won the battle. So that in a certain sense, there are rather cynical, realistic ways of understanding this whole process. When Constantine was faced with the possibility of Christianity increasing its influence, he jumped on the bandwagon. In fact, his father had jumped on the bandwagon before as a supporter of Christianity. And one of the reasons was that the existing religions of the time, which are Sol Invictus and Mithraism, had similarities to Christianity, so that all three could blend together into something which he could lead at the same time as satisfying the people. Constantine saw the opportunity to blend all the religions together, but at the same time he didn't want to change what had previously been the holidays of Mithraism and Sol Invictus to the holidays which existed in Christianity. Previous to uh, Constantine, the day which celebrated Christ's birth was January the 6th. But in order to pacify, or in order to blend the religions further, he brought about Christmas Day ha occurring on the 25th of December, which was the old Mithraist and Sol Invictus celebration of the rebirth of the sun. He introduced a version of Christianity which also played on many of his pagan beliefs. And for example, it is thought that he was a worshiper of the sun god Mithras. And it is thought that the sun god Mithras in, in uh, that tradition's belief system has a birthday around the time of the winter solstice, i.e. around December 25th. And as we all know, there's nothing about December 25th in the New Testament. Then the next uh, holiday he had to deal with was Easter. And in fact, there was a celebration held under Mithraism and Sol Invictus, which was called Estre. So he basically hijacked that festival as well and brought about it celebrating the death and rebirth of Jesus Christ. The actual dating, though, of uh, Easter as a permanent fixture, they tried to sort out at the Council of Nicaea, but they weren't able to come to an agreement, which is why we now have Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. The Roman interpretation of Christianity 
merges these ideas and these traditions. And so we end up sometime in the post-Constantine period of the church deciding that December 25th is, you know, in effect the birthday of Jesus Christ, uh, when there's no even suggestion or hint of that in biblical literature. Um, when Dan Brown makes his suggestion that this great cover-up has gone on, that these true early Christian beliefs have been replaced with all these pagan ideas and pagan symbols and sun god imagery, um, a lot of people get nervous uh, and, and become uh, instinctively critical of the Da Vinci Code. But I think Dan Brown's actually on a pretty good historical footing with some of these uh, suggestions, at least writ large. His detail may be wrong or may be designed to serve um, his fast-paced plot. But the big picture question of how Constantine and subsequent Roman emperors reshaped Christianity to serve their own purpose of political theory for the empire is a powerful and I think largely valid argument. So he ordered that all documents referring to the Gospels before the fourth century, which was the era in which he lived, be destroyed, whether they were written by pagan writers or whoever. And the Gospels were then rewritten from this point onwards. The four accepted Gospels that are in the New Testament that everyone agrees are part of the New Testament uh, heritage, all of the archaeologists, serious independent biblical scholars, uh, linguists, etc., believe that those four documents were written at their earliest 30 or 40 years after the death of Jesus, and at their latest perhaps 100 or 120 years after the death of Jesus. So the, the landmark bright line test for whether something is true by biblical standards, we have to remember when we look at these documents, interesting as they are, powerful as they are, powerful as the story they tell is, that they were all written long after the fact. Um, if we think about our own experience and we think what it would be like for my son or my grandson to describe, for example, I don't know, the impeachment of Bill Clinton, when we think how much people have forgotten about the impeachment of Bill Clinton just a few years after the fact, imagine if that story were being written as contemporaneous history and eyewitness observation 70 years from now. Um, so... The Gospels are interesting because they clearly do contain information that appears to be fact. They're at odds with each other on a number of points. Um, and they were clearly, as Dan Brown suggests, chosen from among many other accounts. And someone, most likely in the circle of Constantine, from that time to the time of Pope Gregory, 300 years later, someone or some ones went through an editing process and said, these are in, but these are out, these are blasphemous, these are heretical, we don't want to hear about this line of reasoning, and in most cases destroyed or burned the, the heretical um, alternative scriptures. It was basically as if the president of America rewrote American history to make it appear that he was the savior of America. Constantine came to the conclusion, rightly or wrongly, that Jesus Christ, the purpose of Jesus Christ was to liberate the Jewish people from the Roman occupation. And in fact, he had failed. And Constantine's rationale was that he had actually saved Christians who were the descendants of the Jews, or so he thought. And it was he who was the new Christ and not Jesus Christ himself. So he basically remodeled the religion based upon him. The good book did not arrive by facsimile from heaven. <laughs> the Bible, as we know it, was finally presided over by one man, the pagan emperor Constantine. I thought Constantine was a Christian. Oh, hardly. No, he was a lifelong pagan who was baptized on his deathbed. Constantine was Rome's supreme holy man. From time immemorial, his people had worshipped a balance between nature's male deities 
and the goddess, or sacred feminine. But a growing religious turmoil was gripping Rome. Three centuries earlier, a young Jew named Jesus had come along, preaching love and a single God. Centuries after his crucifixion, Christ's followers had grown exponentially and had started a religious war against the pagans. Or did the pagans commence war against the Christians? We, we can't be sure who began the atrocities in that period. But we can at least agree that the conflict grew to such proportions that it threatened to tear Rome in two. So Constantine may have been a uh, lifelong pagan, but he was also a pragmatist. And in 325 Anno Domini, he decided to unify Rome under a single religion, Christianity. Christianity was on the rise. He didn't want his empire torn apart. And to strengthen this new Christian tradition, Constantine held a famous ecumenical gathering known as the Council of Nicaea. And at this council, the many sects of Christianity debated and uh, voted on, well, uh, everything from the acceptance and rejection of specific gospels to the date for Easter, to the ministry of the sacrament, and of course, the immortality of Jesus. I don't follow. Masha, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by many of his followers as a mighty prophet, as a great and powerful man, but a man, nevertheless, a mortal man. Not the son of God? Not even his nephew, twice removed. Constantine did not create Jesus' divinity. He simply sanctioned an already widely held idea. Semantics. No, it's not semantics. You're, you're interpreting facts to support your own conclusions. Facts for many Christians. Jesus was mortal one day and divine the next. For some Christians, his divinity was enhanced. Oh, absurd. There was even a formal announcement of his promotion. They couldn't even agree on the Nicene Creed. Excuse me. Who is God? Who is man? How many have been murdered over this question? As long as there has been one true God, there has been killing in his name. What's going on? They laugh cause they know they're untouchable Not because what I said was wrong Ever it may rain I will live by my own policies I will sleep with a clear conscience I will sleep in peace Kung Fu, and it is strong. <laughs>